I want to talk to you about the power. Stay with me. I want to talk to you about the power of the cross. And I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians. Now remember, we are going to have communion when I'm done ministering the word. And as I, as we have communion together, many of you are going to be healed because this is the day for your healing. This is the time for your miracle. I want to read 1 Corinthians 2. I'm going to begin at verse 1. Lord, I thank you for your word. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness, in fear, in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, here Paul makes an amazing statement. A very astonishing one when you think about it. Why? It would be an amazing statement for anyone to make, but it would be really amazing for a Jewish man and a scholarly Jewish man to make that statement. Because the Jews esteemed knowledge, prized knowledge above anything else in life. If you talk to a Jewish man today, what, what, what he prizes most is knowledge. And when Paul made that statement in verse 2 that I read twice, I'm going to read it again now, it's astonishing when you think about it because here is a very scholarly, highly educated, knowledgeable man saying, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why did Paul say that? Greg, because prior to that he was in Athens on his way to Corinth. I just read Corinthians. On his way to Corinth. Corinth is an, is a, is an ancient port city today in Greece. I've been there. I actually walked in ancient Corinth myself years ago. I went to the ruins of ancient Corinth and taught on the Holy Spirit when I was younger. And I remember driving from Athens to Corinth on a mini bus with a group of believers. And we went to Corinth. And Paul was on his way from Athens to Corinth. In Athens, according to Acts 17, he talked with philosophers on Mars Hill, the Acropolis. And people in Athens in those days, highly esteemed philosophy. They talked about politics and philosophy and such things. Democracy, they say, started in Athens, in that same place called Mars Hill. They would sit and debate day after day. So Paul now is sitting with these philosophers and to their amazement, they find out how knowledgeable he is because he knew about their poets. 
He said, one of your poets wrote, one of your poets said, which means Paul knew philosophy. Now you got to put both together. He's in Athens, talking to philosophers. Not a whole lot happened in Athens. Very few people came up later and said, can we talk further? So now on the way to Corinth, he makes a decision. He says, I am determining to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So he writes to the church in Corinth. He says, so he says, and brethren, when I came to you, when I came to you, verse one, when I came to you, I did not come with excellency of speech. Because you saw the, 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 the use, the, 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 the no use for it in Athens. He saw how empty they were in Athens. All that philosophy meant nothing. He says, I didn't come to you with excellency of speech or wisdom. So now he's talking about his visit prior. He, he said, uh, when, when I came to see you the last time, I determined, past tense, not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Because he saw the, the difference. He saw the change. Because history says, history says, that when he came to Corinth the first time, because he came more than once, when he came there the first time, 25,000 people were saved from his visit. Remember, the Lord said to him, I have much people in the city. I want you to stay here. And in a, and a city at the time of 200 or so thousand people around there, think about 25,000, Matt, 25,000 out of 200 were saved when Paul came the first time in the beginning of his ministry. What message did he preach? Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then he says, I was with you. He's talking about his last trip. I was with you in weakness, in fear, in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, like in Athens, but in the demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. And the power of God means the cross. The cross. So that's why I say it's astonishing that he would make such an amazing statement. The difference is the cross. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 1 and let's read verse 17 through 24. Now we're celebrating the message of Calvary. We're celebrating what does the cross mean? Why are we celebrating the victory of Calvary today? Why? This is Holy Week. Why? Paul writes, Dear Lord, I feel that I'm only just talking about this. In 1 Corinthians 1.17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, because if I use wisdom of words, the cross of Christ will have none effect. Verse 17, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. When people use enticing words, when people preach messages that are not about the cross, but motivational messages or messages of hope, the cross loses its effect on people's lives. 
But what is meant by the cross? Like, why the cross? I'm going to tell you in just a moment what we see through the cross. Lord, help me, to, help me tell him. He said, for the preaching of the cross to them is to them that perish foolishness. When you preach the cross to someone who prizes wisdom and prizes knowledge and is worldly, the message of the cross is foolishness. But unto us, verse 18, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. How? Through the cross. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudence. How? Through the cross. Have you noticed the more educated they become, the less they live the life of a Christian? Have you noticed out there the more they know of wisdom, the world's wisdom and knowledge, the less they know the Lord. The less they know the power of God in their life. Where is the wise? Verse 20. Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. What is the foolishness of God? The cross. Because it says the cross to them is foolishness. Therefore, that foolishness, which they call foolishness, is wiser than men. And the weakness of God, meaning the cross, is stronger than man. What is, think about this, Jesus on the cross in weakness. That weakness of God on the cross is stronger than man. What Paul is saying is, the foolishness of God that you call foolishness, meaning the work of Calvary, is wiser than man. And the weakness of the of of God on the cross, he was weak. He died in weakness, it says. He's stronger than man. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wives after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised God has chosen, yes, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. All right. What do we mean by the cross? Are we speaking about some symbol or ancient means of execution? No. The cross refers to the Lord's sacrificial death on the cross and all that that death accomplished for you and me. Everything the cross has accomplished for you and me, that's what the cross means. The cross is not some symbol or an ancient means of execution. The cross is... What his death on the cross, the Lord's sacrificial death on the cross accomplishes in us. 
So let's talk about that. It represents one perfect, all sufficient sacrifice. The priest, it says the, the priests in the Old Covenant stood there. Meaning the work went on. It was never complete because they were standing. But when Jesus died, he sat down. Mean complete. I love what Hebrews, can, can, can we look at Hebrews chapter 10? And can we look at verse 11? Look, today we're talking about the work of Calvary. Every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So here we see that the old covenant priest stood, meaning their work was never done. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, the Lord sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wow. So that one sacrifice covered all time and eternity. And I love what Isaiah 53, verse 6 declares. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. One, all, sufficient, perfect sacrifice. Complete. Work complete. That word iniquity in that portion here is the word rebellion. And the Lord hath laid on him the rebellion of us all. God visited on Jesus the rebellion of us all. All the evil due to us, all the evil due to us came upon the Lord. So that all the good due to him, the holy, sinless, obedient son of God, might be made available to all of us through the work of the cross. So when you talk about the cross, you talk about something that is so beautiful and so awesome. Sweetest Jesus, I give you praise. Grace. When I see the cross, I see grace. Christianity is not a set of rules. It's not about trying harder. It's about yielding. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about grace. It's to bring us to the end of ourselves. The cross brings us to, to the end of ourselves, the end of our efforts, the end of our own strength, the end of our own doing, where we trust him for our salvation. Let me, let me explain grace to you the best way I know. Greg, you've got children, right? Okay. And I want you all to think about this for a minute. Someone kills your baby. Someone kills your child. You have three choices. I'm talking in the, in the natural. We who have children, you know how dear they are to us. My children can do no wrong. Even when I'm really upset with them, it only takes one, one moment when I see their face, I forget all about it. You can be very upset, 
with your son, very upset with your daughter. And one moment of need in their life, you're there for them. Everything is forgotten. So we parents love our children. But God forbid someone should kill one of your children. You have three choices. You can kill them back, called vengeance. For that, you go to prison. Two, you can let the law deal with them. That's called justice. Three, you can forgive them. I have a dear friend, you probably remember him, Steve Rock. Someone killed his boy. A drunk driver, a drunk driver killed his boy. His son, David, was killed by a drunk driver. And I asked him that question one day, and he couldn't answer me. He was so shaken up. I said, Steve, you're a daddy who loved, oh, and how he loved David. He would sing sometimes some of the beautiful songs, and he would always put, put his son's name in the song, you know? And so anyways, uh, I said, Stephen, I said, can you forgive that man? That drunk driver that killed your boy. I said, no. He said, I've tried. I said, God went way beyond forgiveness. Because we put his son on the cross. We are the ones that killed him. I said, we are the ones that put Jesus on the cross. And God had three choices to kill us back, or to judge us, or forgive us. But he went way beyond forgiveness. I said, now you think about this for a second. I was talking to Steve Rock. I said, you think about this for a second. A drunk driver killed your boy. You let the law deal with him. You're, you're, you're not thinking about forgiving him at that time anyway. This was years ago when we talked about that. I said, but can you imagine if you look at that man or that person that killed your boy and you said, I not only forgive you, I'm trying to explain grace to you. I'm not only for, forgive you, I adopt you. Not only do I adopt you, I give you the place and the inheritance of the child you kill. Not only do I just adopt you and give you his place and inheritance, I will love you as much as I loved him. I said, Steve, that's the closest explanation of grace I know, and it's not the full story. How do we know the grace of God? This. The cross. Because the cross released me from punishment. The, 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 the cross released me from death. The cross released me from being judged. Through the cross, I'm forgiven. Through the cross, I'm adopted as a child of God. Through the cross, I'm given the inheritance of Jesus. Through the cross, God loves me as much as he loved his son. And then he, he, then he, he says to me, I will love you forever with an everlasting love. That's what the cross speaks of. That's powerful. The grace of God God cannot accept us by producing our own righteousness. Because we can't. We only accept the righteousness of Jesus on the cross. You know, uh, grace begins 
when ability stops. And say it again. Grace begins in my life when my ability stops, when I trust him, not myself. That's when I begin to experience the grace of God, the love of God. In 1 Corinthians, I hope this is blessing you as it is blessing me already just talking about it. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. I'm reading again 1 Corinthians 1 now, beginning at verse 22. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and wisdom of God. This is so powerful. It's easy to preach Jesus as the great teacher. It's easy to preach Jesus as the great healer. But that's not enough. That will not change your life. To hear about his teachings and healings will not change your life. But to know the work of Calvary will change your life. Thank you, Lord. So we find his grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. When we come to the end of ourselves, when we come to the place and say, Lord, I cannot do it. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations that was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the message of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, it might depart from me. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We don't know, we may never know what the thorn in the flesh was. But to someone like Paul, the thorns in the flesh had to do with the strangers of the day when Joshua came into the promised land and they allowed the strangers to stay in the land. God said, there'll be thorns in your flesh. We don't know what that thorn was in his life. All we know is when he went to the, to the Lord and said, please deliver me, he said, my grace is sufficient. We all have a weakness we don't really like, we don't really, really want. We all have some kind of a problem we don't really enjoy. It's time we get to the place where our ability will stop, and the grace of God will take over. But we say, Lord, I can't do it. I can't fight this thing anymore. Please take over. And I think this is the, the key to holiness. Hebrews 12, I'm almost done. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. In the old covenant, holiness consisted of, of keeping a set of very complicated rules. 
So in the New Testament, Peter says to you and I to be holy. He says, be holy like God is holy. But how? How do I get to that place of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord? Do I do it by keeping a set of rules like in the Old Covenant? The Old uh, Covenant sets rules, but the New Testament enables us to fulfill the law in Him. When I surrender to the work of Calvary, I can live holy. It's not a set of rules. It's saying, Lord, live your life in and through me. I cannot do it. I cannot find holiness by trying. I have to deny and die to myself and let Jesus live out his life in and through me. Only the, only the cross can do that. So Christianity is about yielding, not struggling. It's not about effort, but union. It's not about effort, but union, where you become one with the, with the Lord, and suddenly His grace becomes sufficient. And what is so remarkable is you find His love. In John 15, he said, no greater love, there's no greater love than a friend giving his life for another. He was demonstrating how he was about to show his love on the cross. This is the most amazing truth of all. The most glorious, well, truth of all. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. His love. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless free. I love what it says in John 17. You're playing it right, Greg. I in them, thou in me. John 17, 23. That they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the world, the foundation of the world. You know what this says? You have loved them as you have loved me. And you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Which means God loved us from the foundation of the world too. Because Jesus said you've loved them as you've loved me in verse 23. And in verse 24, you've loved me before the foundation of the world. Greg, do you know that Jesus loved us before the foundation of the world? It's not what it says in Ephesians 1. Chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we might be holy and stand in love. We don't understand that, I know. 
But that's the truth. That God so loved us to call us his children. In 1 John, I want to read to you verse 3, uh, uh, ch chapter 3, verse 1. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Or 1 John 4, verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or substitution of our sins. You're about to be touched and blessed and healed, many of you, as you just surrender to his love. In due time, Jesus died for you. While you and I were in weakness, we were ungodly, we were sinners and enemies of God. If you read that portion in the epistles, it says, in due time, Jesus died for us while we were without strength. Ungodly. Sinners. Enemies of God. Yet he died for us. How much more now will we be saved from wrath? I want you to get ready to partake communion with me. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Surely he bore our sorrows and by his stripes we are healed. He was wounded, sing it with me, Greg, for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Surely He bore our sorrow. And by His stripes we are healed. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of My richest gain I count but loss And poor contempt On all my pride For That I should boast, save in the death of Christ, my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I. Sacrifice them to his blood. See, 
from his head his hands his feet sorrow and love flow mingle down did air such love and sorrow meet or thorns compose so rich a crown Lord thank you we thank you for your love your precious death on the cross and I ask you today Lord to forgive us all to cleanse and purify us again for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you 1 Corinthians 11:23 says that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this doing remembrance of me after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped saying this cup is the new testament in my blood this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup ye do proclaim the lord's death till he come wherefore whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the lord but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the lord's body for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep for if we would judge ourselves we should not be judged thank you lord for your love on the cross bless it be your holy name forever my jesus I love thee I know thou art mine For thee all the follies of sin I resign My gracious redeemer my savior of thou if ever i love thee my jesus this now i want you to take the bread right now as we get ready for communion He died for you. He was nailed to the cross for you. And he cried, "Father, forgive them. They know not what they do." Greg, would you play for me again all oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus vast and measureless love? you hold the bread up and say dear lord jesus i thank you for your broken body broken for me on calvary's cross 
Lord, I remember when you stood in the house of Caiaphas. And I remember when they beat your precious face. And I remember, Lord, how they buffeted you and mocked you. And I remember when you stood before Pilate the soldiers placed the crown of thorns on your precious head. I remember, Lord, when they whipped your body for me. I remember, Lord, you carried your cross to Calvary. And I remember as you were crucified on Calvary's cross for me. Thank you, Lord. And now, Lord God, I pray, heal my body. Heal my broken body. Your body was broken that my body might be made whole. Thank you, Lord. Remember, saints, he took your disease, your sickness and your pain on his body. He took your sin upon his soul. He was made a sin offering. The Bible says that in Isaiah, that his soul took upon him your sin. His body for your healing. His soul for your salvation. The cross has two sides. The front of the cross, salvation. The back of the cross, your healing. Now partake by faith his broken body. In Jesus' mighty name. Jesus, all glorious. Before we partake of the cup, lift your hands and thank it. Oh Jesus, all glorious, preparing us your temple, born as living stones. Where you're enthroned As you rose From death and power Come rise with him Our worship Rise upon our prayer Let the hand That saw you raise Clothe us in your glory. Draw us by your grace. Sing it with me, Greg. Oh, the glory of your presence. We your temple give you reverence so our eyes to your rest and be blessed by our praise as we Your presence 
Thank you for your blood. Can you hear the sound of heaven? Pray for it. Now all of you say, dear Jesus, I thank you for your blood. Shed for me first in Gethsemane when your sweat became blood. Shed for me again in the house of God. Shed for me again in the Pretoria before Pilate. Shed for me again on Golgotha's hill when you were crucified. When they pierced your side. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your blood. Cleanse us, Lord. Wash us again, Lord. Cleanse each one of us. Cleanse me. Purify my heart for you. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing heart and spirit. So shall I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners be converted unto thee. Now, Lord, as I partake this precious cup, thank you for your blessed power to cleanse and to make us all whole. Partake by faith in Jesus' precious name. That blessed anointing here we're all sensing, so beautiful. Thank you, Lord. We give thanks with a grateful heart. I want to read for you this amazing portion of Scripture. The Word of God tells us that David, who was after God's own heart, understood the value of a sacrifice. The value of a sacrifice comes from the value we place on that sacrifice. We are living, saints, and I want to talk to you heart to heart now. Now I want to prepare you for the things that are coming upon the earth that you might be strong and get stronger as the days ahead of us approach. I want you to stop playing and I want you all to pay close attention to what I'm, I'm telling you. The Bible makes it very clear how God views what is worth to us, things that we value in life. I'm going to give you the secret that will guarantee your financial survival for years to come. 
I believe the Lord has shown me an amazing biblical truth about this. In 2 Samuel 24, 24, it says, King David said to Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer a burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. You remember there was a plague in the land. And David was told to offer God a sacrifice on a piece of property where now we call that Temple Mount today in Jerusalem that was owned by a man named Aruna. And Aruna offered David the entire property for free because he said in verse 22, let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good unto him. Behold, here be the oxen, burnt sacrifice, threshing instruments, other instruments, of the oxen for wood. All these things did Aruna as a king give unto the king. And Aruna said to the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. But David understood something very, very powerful, that the value of a sacrifice comes from the value you place on it. The plague did not stop till David offered a sacrifice with value. You may be going through a plague of some sort financially. Or you may be facing a plague in the future financially. You have got to understand what the Bible says here. David was told, go and offer God a sacrifice. He already repented. He said, Lord, I I made a mistake. I did wrong. Don't punish the people. Punish me. I'm the one who failed. But that repentance did not stop the plague. The plague stopped when he offered that sacrifice on the altar. In verse 25, it says that David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered a burnt offerings, peace offerings, so the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed. But, In verse 24, he said, I will surely give you the price. I will not offer a burnt offering to the Lord that costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and auction for 50 shekels of silver. 50 shekels of silver put the the, the price or the value he placed on it. Aruna said, you can do it, you can take it, you can offer it for free. And David said, no, I will not give God what costs me nothing. Because I know God will not accept it if I don't place value on it. The plague will not stop if I accept it from you for free. The plague will stop only if I place value on the sacrifice I'm going to give. And the plague stopped. He paid 50 shekels of silver. He builds an altar. He offers burnt offerings, peace offerings. The Lord now is entreated and the plague stops. What plague are you facing today? No, no, this is not about money. This is not about money. This is about the value we place on what we give God. 
What value do we, do we place on what we give God? No one believes you buy miracles. Only fools believe that. But we believe that when we give God an offering, we are putting value on that offering. It means something to us. It costs us something. God said in Malachi chapter 1 something very, very, very powerful. He said, don't give me anything that costs you nothing. Don't give me anything that has no meaning to you. He said, a son honors his father, a servant honors his master. If I be your father, where is my honor? If I'm your master, where is my fear? He said, you offer, verse 7, you offer me polluted bread, meaning there's no value. And you say, wherein have we polluted your bread? He said, because you say the table of the Lord is contemptible by giving me something that means nothing to you. Verse 8 of Malachi 1 says, if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? If you give me something that means nothing, is it not evil? If you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now to your governor. Will he be pleased with you? Will he accept you? It's powerful. And now I pray you beseech God that he may be gracious to you. Now the Lord is speaking through Malachi. He says, I want to be gracious to you. But will your governor, if you give him a gift that means nothing to you, will he regard your person? Wow. God says, I have no pleasure in you. Neither will I expect any offering out of your hand unless you put value on it. I will not accept it. I have no pleasure in it if you don't give it from your heart. And David understood. If it does not mean anything to us, it means nothing to the Lord. If you want to protect yourself today and tomorrow, understand this about God. He will not accept any offering from you if it doesn't mean anything to you. If it has no value in your sight. There's no such thing, biblically speaking, as an easy sacrifice. It has to have meaning, to have value. It has to come from the heart, not reluctantly or in response to pressure. We have to honor the Lord with our giving, placing value on our giving. It says, honor the Lord with your substance in Proverbs chapter 3. It's about honor. God says, do you honor your governor when you bring him a sacrifice that is not accepted, that has no value? Honor the Lord with your substance and the first fruits of all your increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, not today only, but tomorrow. And your presses shall burst out with new wine. How beautiful. Those who do not honor the Lord with their money are the first ones to usually complain when financial troubles come. Those who don't honor God with their money are the first ones to complain about financial trouble. So God has a way out for you and I, out of financial trouble. It's called honoring him. When we honor him, we come out of financial trouble. So if financial troubles are plaguing you now, 
It's time to examine the seed you've been sowing. If you're facing financial trouble, it's time to examine the seed you've been sowing. Because the wrong seed will not bring the right harvest. A few dollars will never get you out of financial troubles. If we sow sparingly, we reap sparingly. We stay right where, where we are. If we sow bountifully, that's when the miracles begin. Because giving grudgingly will not do it. And when people give little, they give grudgingly. They, they, they give without honoring God. Giving, now this is, this is very, very, very important. Giving little will not work in times of trouble. Giving sparingly will not work in times of trouble. It's time we offer the right sacrifice for the right harvest. And today we are facing serious, troubled things around us. Nations are troubled. People are troubled. Financials uh, are shaking. People's finances. People are worried about their, their finances. The church in Philippi understood one thing. That they have had to honor Paul the Apostle. In Philippians chapter, I'm almost done. Don't leave me yet. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul the Apostle wrote to the church and they understood this when he said, I rejoiced greatly that now at last your care of me has flourished again, wherein you were careful. So now, Paul says, you are taking care of me. And no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but you in verse 15. And then he says, my God now will supply all your needs because you honored me. Honor is very key when it comes to securing financially our present and our future. So, today it's time we honor the Lord with all our hearts like David honored him by placing value on the sacrifice he gave. And when he did, the plague stopped. And I'm going to pray with you right now that God Almighty will speak to you. As you honor him, he will honor you. As you give him sacrificially what is worth much to you, he will bless you today and tomorrow. Lord, speak to them in Jesus' name. And Lord, we agree. Come on, stretch your hands towards me. I'm feeling the anointing. Lord, we agree that financial need will be met. For you said, honor the Lord with your substance and the first fruits of all your increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses will burst out with new wine. And this blessed Easter time, Lord, when we celebrate your victory on the cross and your resurrection, I pray that you'll establish your people and bless the work of their hands. Whatever they touch will prosper and multiply. Be no lack in their life. For your word says none lacked among them. Let none lack among us. Not one of them will lack. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'm going to ask you to give before we say goodbye to the Lord's work. You can sow your seed right now on the platform you're watching us on. You can go to our website, benihin.org. You can text it, BHM45777. Thank you for letting me be with you today. Thank you for joining me here, to here today. But before you leave me, sow a seed. Honor the Lord with a seed that is worth 
much in your life. Love you. Thank you. I pray the Lord will continue to protect you. Lord, I pray that you'll bless our homes and families also with salvation. Save our loved ones, Lord. Give them longevity of life and ministry in Jesus' name. We give you the praise. And God's people said a mighty amen.